Oh. It's it's maximized. Uh, oh, it, you're not you're not missing anything. Let me, um, and this has a uh, a BusyBox Linux shell and also a Texas in, uh, Texas Instruments uh, shell. Okay, here we go. Um, so what TI has given us is basically, like I said, fully capable diagnostic firmware. Type you go into the shell and type in prod show. Uh, oops. You got the um, you know the hardware revision serial number, um, uh, file names for spoofing firmware versions, change the modem's IP, uh, the MAC addresses. Um, basically, and then if you type um, prod set, you can go in and change all those parameters, um, and then uh, save it and. Very simple. You're done. If you want to change something, uh, let's see. And outside of that, we have the standard um, BusyBox Linux uh, Linux console here. Um, okay. So basically, it, you know, it's it's very powerful. You know, Linux on a modem. You can do whatever you want with it. Um, next, I'm going to show you guys Hacksomatic. Uh, after Hacksaware, Ryko has been working on um, this programmer, like we talked about, the Hacksomatic does SPI, JTAG, and has a serial port as well. Uh, where is it? He was up apparently all night last night programming this for me, just yeah, as a DEF CON demonstration. And there's a lot of people who are working with this FTDI chip, making their own programmers. This one's just targeted for uh, it does cable modems, uh, Xbox 360 NAND, um, so anything with SPI. He, I know he programmed a, a Foxconn motherboard BIOS with it. He programmed an Acer, uh, one of those new 3D monitors with it, just just because he felt like it. No, USB JTAG has a, a Cypress chip and some other chip in it. This is FTDI, just one chip. Uh, I have a USB JTAG NT with me. Just, it, it's a good thing, but the software sucks. It really does. This software is, is uh, you know, GUI and uh, it's trying to be, you know, more user friendly. And this is actually about twice as fast on SPI reads and a little bit faster on writes. Uh, it, re it generally reads about two megabytes per second. Um, and writes the 6120 will write about 200k a second. Um, the newer expansion flash chips will write about 475k a second. But I do not have one of those modems with me that has one of the newer chips. So I plug it in. It cuts the power to the CPU. And let's see. Oh, the Hacksomatic lets you choose your uh, your clock speed for uh, programming right 30 megahertz right now. And detect. We've got a uh, expansion flash chip, and then just uh, reading the flash right now. Um, right now, he's still finishing up the software. Um, we're beta testing it, and um, see, it's it's pretty fast. Red eight megs right there. Um, so we're going to put this into mass production uh, once the software is finished, and it's uh, it's it's a really cool device. So I just read the whole flash. I can write it back. I can program any of these areas, flash the firmware, whatever, what have you. Um, there's another application that does. Um, you can program PIC controllers as well. Uh, basically anything that this chip will handle. Let's see. Oops. Sorry, I'm trying to figure out where we left off. Already went over that we, stuff. There you go. Oh, new tools. Yep. Um, there's some various tools that some of our admins and members have written. This is called this one is uh, SNMP cert cert grabber. We'll scan the uh, HFC network for modems that are in factory mode. If it finds one, it'll uh, grab the certs, the max, and um, whatever you need if you're going to be cloning. Uh, 
course, like we said, don't do that. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. There may be the way, the way I it, see this. If you pay for, you know, say Comcast, you pay for 50 megabit service. You're paying a hundred dollars a month. If you want to run a diagnostic modem for whatever reason, it shouldn't matter. You're paying them and you know, it, it's not illegal. It's just against the terms of service. And if they catch you, they will ban you for life, but it's not against the law. So <laughs> there you go. That, that's the way I see it. But they probably don't agree with me because I called them monkeys last time I was here. And um, w there's a, a Comcast executive who's like their head of uh, broadband who's an active member of the SP Hacker Forum. And when noobs come on and say, oh, my modem's not working anymore. Why? Blah, blah, blah. He comes on and talks shit to him and laughs at him. But um, they actually, Comcast and the rest of the big ISPs use our forum to find out what the holes in their system are and how to fix them. But so yet, we've had they, to But they <laughs> failed to fix them after two years. This so. is true. Um, how much time do we have? Um, I thought after speaking, uh, you know, in 2008 that they would immediately increase security. The major c companies, you know, Comcast, Charter, Time Warner, Cox, really have not started increasing security until this year, um, enforcing BPI plus, which um, uh, verifies the MAC address based on a, a, a certificate, um, which is issued by VeriSign. Um, and the reason for all the security holes still is that they're still allowing DOCSIS 1.0 modems on their networks. DOCSIS 1.0 had no way to verify that. All it has is BPI, which encrypts your traffic, but they did not have EPI Plus, which verifies the MAC and serial number to the certificate. And, and Comcast has um, tried to get rid of all the 1.0 modems on their networks, but there's still holes in Comcast because their walled garden is not configured correctly. And the rest of the ASPs just, you know, there's just so many holes in DOCSIS 1 and they don't want to spend the money to go out in the field and replace all these modems with DOCSIS 2 modems, 3, whatever. What's that? Depends on where you are, though. I, I've heard Cox Las Vegas is, is fairly secure, but it really depends. What's that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't have them, but. I, I know people are hacking DOCSIS 3 on Cox, but it, some, some ISPs take more time than others to figure out how to do it. He's right. Um, this is a program uh, one of the other admins wrote that it allows you to back up. If you're going to hack your modem, you want to back up the uh, flash chip before you do that because if you just fuck it up, you want to have an original backup. Um, if you don't have an SPI programmer, you can use this utility to back it up uh, via the virtual COM port through the uh, they're using the U-boot bootloader for the Puma 5 modems. So uh, th that's pretty cool. People are wondering, for all, how do I back up my full flash without buying the $60 programmer? Well, we have an application for it now. Um, Blake, do you want to talk about this? I can. I'll stay here. Um, <laughs> basically the future, I, I'm not really sure what they're going to do about the problems of actually fix them or not. But one thing that we had thought, you know, the botnets, the faster the home users' internet connections get, the, the bigger threat botnets will be. If you think about it, like if botnets on like dial-up is not, you know, you have to have a huge number of machines actually cause, uh, you know, sufficient denial of service attack. If you have people on DOCSIS 3 with these really high speeds, all of a sudden you don't need, you know, as many computers. So that's always a... Uh, I'm sure some of you have dedicated servers. Average your port speed is probably 100 megabits. Some of you have a gigabit. Uh, take, you know, 10 DOCSIS 3 modems on Comcast with 10 megs up. That's a 10 modem botnet to knock out your server. So uh, they just have to be really mindful of that because if uh, people are, you know, getting exploited and being used for botnets, it's, you know, it, it could get bad. It could get really bad. Or on the, on the other side, not just botnets, but if somebody, you know, were inclined to get a number of diagnostic modems and put them all online, like he said, put 10 diagnostic modems online and all of a sudden you can start, you know, taking down pretty uh, pretty heavy servers in terms of now service attack. Uh, also with the features of, I think there's a good possibility they're going to keep trying to, to crack down on the, the modem hacking, but it's, it's kind of tough and I haven't actually seen any real convictions. And that's what I'm wondering what's going to happen with these cases. Yeah, Mastodog's case got thrown out. Um, Mass Mods, he told me he's going to plead guilty and he is guilty so he should. Duringal will not plead guilty. He's going to go to trial if he has to. Um, I just lost my train of thought. You can go into the next slide if you want. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, I had too much to drink. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, 
actually skip this just role playing it's not not too fun all stuff we've already went over go on one more okay. right again there you go okay so problems and solutions one thing that we had brought up last time and docsys 3 does have in the spec for aes but so far it doesn't look like many people are using it is that if you're using like 56 bit des that's crackable. That's kind of you know scary for your privacy when you, you already have the packet omatic, right? So that can can watch your traffic. Your neighbors could see your traffic if it's unencrypted. With the BPI plus, if it's just 56 bit deaths, probably only a matter of time if somebody's motivated to actually you know write a plugin for hack or packet omatic and you know go ahead and start sniffing all the encrypted uh, Doxis traffic, which maybe people already are doing it. I don't, you know, I don't know. I want to add something. Hacksware has the ability to create and generate a self-signed BPI plus certificates if you change your Mac. That was actually something that Motorola added to the SB4100, I believe. It's a Doxis 1 modem. They wanted it to be Doxis 1.1 compliant. So Motorola wrote these code where you can uh, sign your own certificates and um, we, we took that and uh, Ryko put it into Hacksware. However, it doesn't really work because uh, Cisco, like a Cisco CMTS by default, will not accept self signed certificates. But uh, like, in, like, say, a third world country where they want to have 4100s keep working, they will enable um, self signed certificates to work, and there you go. So there, there is code to generate the self signed ones, but if you want a real certificate, you got to get it from VeriSign, and nobody has uh, yet to crack BPI. Plus. Sure. And we had clone detection last time. Really hasn't been anything that I've seen that's come out to try to uh, really detect that with the actual perfect clones, meaning you actually clone the certificates and everything else. It seems like they're still getting, uh, getting away with it. So from my perspective, you know, situation for the ISPs is, is pretty bleak. That's why I said I don't really think Doxis is a good uh, protocol for in terms of security on providing people with internet access. I mean, it's great for us as hackers if you want, you know, anonymous internet or, you know, you want to be able to put as much stuff online as you want or get whatever speed you want, but from a ISP perspective, I'd say it's pretty bleak. I don't I don't see them coming up with any, you know, solution in the at least immediate future. The way I explain this to Blake, you know, Doxis 1.1 was certified about 10 years ago. Doxis 3.0 was certified in 2008. Basically, all the, the U.S. cable operators are running Doxis 1.1 networks with channel bonding. So they're not using, they're using 10 year old technology and just bonding the channels to give you more speed. And they're not using the AES security or, or anything else. So they're really, and it's mostly because their admins don't know what the hell they're doing. They're getting better at it because they're going to SB Hacker and seeing what they need to do to fix the holes, but they just don't know what the hell they're doing. Let's see. Okay. There's a little bit of stuff for you guys to remember. How to get anonymous, fast internet on Doxis network, the equipment used, how to stay anonymous, different firmwares. But at this point, pretty much if you're using the older, like 51, 5101, you're talking about Hacksware, you're on the newer stuff, you know, the Hacksware Alpha, why it's possible, <laughs> hardware security, what Doxis 3 really is, you know, bonding at faster speeds. And uh, development and reversing is as easy as your sister. It was added by Dev Delay. He couldn't make it here this year, but uh, de yeah, uh, Dev spoke with us last time, but he couldn't make it out. But yeah, he added this and for the, us. And these, uh, you know, new security adoptions so far, so they they can be defeated. It's kind of a thing with security. It seems to be a recurring trend of you keep having the same problems. You know, every time there's a new device or a new technology, it still has problems from the past, and it just keeps repeating itself. So people just keep breaking it. Uh, so you know, enabling one security feature on a CMTS may mean disabling or sacrificing another. It seems like every time Cisco releases a new code train for their CMTS IOS, you know, it you know creates new security and then opens up old bugs. Um, I know, and uh, Cable Labs has a tiered qualification system for the CMTSs. They have bronze, silver, and uh, gold, I believe, like Olympic medals. Um, Cisco and Aris, which is the majority of use in, in, in the world, um, they're all bronze certified, I meaning they can only do downstream bonding, not upstream. Um, gold, uh, Casa Systems has gold certification for theirs, but they're really a small company and nobody's using them. I know I have a friend down in uh, South Florida who has upstream bonding, and he's the only person I know who has uh, four channels bonded upstream, but he still only gets five megs up. But it, it's coming, and you know, potential for upstream speed is Doxis has become more symmetrical as opposed to the past where it's been really asymmetrical.